the revenue. Ladies and gentlemen, this is Khalid Al Muhannadi again. We are here in the Innovation Theatre. We'll be talking about the incubation centers from around the world USA, Jordan, Qatar, and the globe. So please join us in the Innovation Theatre. In two minutes. <laughs> Ten, nine, eight, seven, six, five, four, three, two, one. Let's rumble! <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon. Thank you everyone for being with us here today. Today we'll be talking about incubation centers from around the world. On my left side, Mr. Khalid Saadeddin, Oasis 500, and Dr. Mohammed Khalil, Qatar University Innovation. Center, uh, Mr. Chris Berry, he is from USA, and he will be talking to us about Silicon Valley, oh, and our great friend Mr. Murat, he will be talking to us about the innovation and acceleration, am I right, in New York. So one from Silicon Valley, and the other one is from New York. Oh, that would be some competition in there, isn't it? There's going to be a fist fight. Oh, fist, oh really? We're ready to rumble. <laughs> so let's rumble. Please, Mr. Khalid, open the session. Assalamu alaikum wa barakatuh. Uh, my name is Khalid Saladin, and just to correct things, I'm ex-Oasis 500. Uh, I used to be a VP of operations uh, and chief coach in there for almost uh, a year and something. Um, uh, Oasis 500, for those of you who don't know, is the premier, or was set up to be the premier um, accelerator slash seed fund uh, in Jordan. Uh, it started uh, as uh, an idea with the 
uh, between the king himself and uh, a number of business leaders in Jordan. Um, it became right now the premier uh, location for Arab entrepreneurs from across the region and beyond. Um, the, uh, I think right now, I've, in the, the year and something that I was there, we helped launch more than 64 uh, businesses uh, from scratch. The, the accelerator model is a little bit different in that it's very aggressive. Uh, you have uh, almost 100 days, do or die, we called it. Um, the way it, it worked, we had a cookie cutter approach. We gave them 10,000 JDs, that's equivalent to 50,000 Qatari Riyals, and they have 100 days to make proof of concept. Um, with that, we'll give them a lot of, uh, of course, physical incubation, as well as mentoring and coaching. And prior to being in admitted to the incubation, they had to go through a training session for like almost a week, non-stop. We used to call it a boot camp, which it really was. Um, that kind of helped us filter out a lot of the not ready startups. So the ones that we focused on were the ones with a lot of potential. I think 80% or, or more of our investment decision was based on the personality of the lead uh, entrepreneur. Uh, sometimes these guys were a, a, a group or a club uh, or a team, and we chose them very, very selectively. Uh, that's pretty much how it started, and, and now it's, it's rolling. The aim was to produce 500 startups in five years from the year of inception, which was in 2011. So by 2016, we should have 500 startups funded, actively funded, and went through the entire uh, acceleration process. And that's why it's been called Oasis 500. That's brilliant. And on the other side of the panel, Mr. Murat. And you can tell us about you and your experiment in New York. Yes, so we started in 2010. In New York in 2010, there were zero accelerators. And we looked at California, Y Combinator, and we thought there should be an institution in New York helping the expanding and growing New York community. So we launched ERA in 2011. And we lined up 250 mentors and around 35 corporate partners. Uh, we provided our companies with uh, free support from Microsoft, Amazon, American Airlines, lots of free products and services. We picked 10 companies and we established one-on-one -on -one mentoring for each company with the mentors. And our mentors are four different uh, types. One of them is investors angel investors and VCs. The other is entrepreneurs, serial entrepreneurs who like created companies, sold them. The third one is corporate executives. They're actually really useful. They help companies enter new markets. They make introductions. They know what's going on out there. What are the big corporations thinking about? And the fourth one is um, vertical experts, people who specialize in like SEO, digital marketing, mobile payments. They come in and help our companies when they are needed. So when we launched the program, the main benefit was the initial money that we put in. We give them $40,000. And also we give them free services, free office space in the middle of New York, free like airline tickets from American Airlines, free hosting, around like $150,000 worth of free hosting from Amazon, Microsoft, Rackspace, and Softlayer, IBM. But then we found out also the mentors are very, very useful, but also our network of 70 companies right now, we've been doing it for uh, three and a half years, we, we've done seven sessions. The 70 companies form a very good alumni network. They help each other, They, if they do something, they teach how to do that to other companies. And we also, when a company graduates, we do not cut them off. We keep helping them. So we are still on the phone with them, they still come visit us, they attend our events. So a company that enters ERA keeps getting the benefits until they exit. So we've seen all these things create a very, very healthy uh, community and our performance of our initial uh, 70 companies is really great. The, everything is going well so far. Wow, that's really impressive. So you've created a community. That's a really a beautiful experiment. 
creating a, com a community around the entrepreneurs. And those particular entrepreneurs will be mentoring other entrepreneurs. They will show them the, the right way, or actually the right path, the best practices. Now, if we will jump to Qatar back again with Dr. Mahmoud, he will tell us about the innovation center in Qatar University. It's a new center, so let us let him talk to us about it, please. Assalamu alaikum. Uh, I'm Mahmoud Abdul Latif. I'm the director of Center for Entrepreneurship at Qatar University. We are newly established unit within uh, School of Business and Economics. We are working to create entrepreneurial culture within Qatar University to support students to develop their business idea and then to move forward to the market. We are working in three area training. So we help students to develop their skills, to support them, and then we are working in the area of incubation. We have a limited resources in terms of incubation, but we are willing to support them through other uh, beer institutions like uh, Enterprise Qatar or Cubic. So we support mainly our student and we started uh, last September, we have uh, entrepreneurial and innovation contest. We have 146 uh, students who joined this uh, competition. And eventually we have three winners team. We incubated those three winners. We have many demanded now, many students joining us in terms of our activities, in terms of uh, coaching, uh, one one-to-one -one, uh, training. So we are growing gradually. This is the first year of our activities and we plan, we plan to have more activities n next year. As you know, uh, summer is coming and uh, the student will be in summer holiday. So from next year, we will have a comprehensive plan for training, business incubation. Also, we are working in terms in terms of research and consultation for other institutions. We work with ICT Qatar, with EQ, and we are happy to help uh, others beside, uh, in addition to our students. Oh, wow. Thank you very much. That's really collaboration. And last but not least, in the heavyweight side of the Silicon Valley, old, well-known, and established sector in USA. Please, Mr. Chris, talk to us about it. So by way of a quick introduction, uh, I'm the CEO of an organization called US Mac, which has been around since 1995, helping non-US technology companies access global markets with an emphasis on the US, but we do help access to non-US markets as well. But the, the interesting thing that I get asked all the time, you know, why is Silicon Valley work? Why is it what it is, right? And people point to institutions. They point to Stanford, they point to Berkeley, they point to the accelerators like 500 startups, Y Combinator, all of these kinds of things. But what I really believe is that what makes the difference, and you know, it was heartening to hear the discussion from both here in Qatar and in New York about creating the sense of community. What is really needed is an ecosystem in which the entrepreneur can actually thrive. And what drives that ecosystem is fundamentally networks of people. If I look in Silicon Valley, there's basically a network of networks. One of the networks is on the finance side, the network of entrepreneurs interacting with venture capitalists, interacting with angels, angel networks, angel forums, those types of things. So there's the finance side of the house. The next network is the network of what I would consider to be industry expertise that one of the things that's fascinating about the place is there is someone in Silicon Valley who knows, right? If you want somebody who knows social marketing, they're there. If you want somebody who understands ASICs, it's there. There are, and it's not just there's one person. There are networks of sort of industry slash vertical specialists. But the last component is it's a network of entrepreneurs. 
the, the real value that we see in accelerators and incubators is not so much the fact that, oh, it's a free space where you can come, and yes, we do believe that mentors are absolutely critically important, but it is that sense of community and it is that sense of entrepreneurs helping other entrepreneurs that is actually what makes the difference. And the what reason that mentoring in Silicon Valley is as powerful as it is is because the vast majority of the mentors, be it the venture capitalist, be it the industry executive, the vice president at Google, the CEO of some new startup, at one point they were all entrepreneurs too. And so there is this embedded network and this embedded ethos, if you will, of entrepreneurs help other entrepreneurs. And it is that act of sharing and the act of helping each other which is actually the jet fuel that drives Silicon Valley. Wow. So while I'm here introducing you as I'm, we are in a competition, now we are talking about sharing, caring, mentoring. So Mr. Khalid Saadeddin, how you reflect that in Jordan and you've been around the Arab world, how do you, how, how do you relate to that? Well, uh, just to build up what my colleagues have said, um, our aim was to try and create this ecosystem. The only way that entrepreneurship would work as a movement, as a solution to a lot of the uh, economic issues and challenges that we have in the Arab world, is that if we create the attitude, we make the shift from everybody is, who is in my space is a, a competition, to everybody who is in my space is a competition. We want everybody to compete, but we want them to collaborate as well. Understanding that competition is, is extremely good to keep you on your toes so that you can do better and better. And the end, at the end of the day, it's the end consumer, it's the client, it's the customer who benefits from that. Um, we pushed for that. We, the way we did it, we did it internally and externally. In, internally, we were trying to uh, propel this and advocate this movement of uh, entrepreneurs mentoring entrepreneurs. So the senior class of maybe two seasons ago or uh, two batches ago can mentor those who are in the same uh, in the same footsteps, following up on them. We also reached out to a lot of uh, successful entrepreneurs in the Arab world. We established a, a mentorship network, uh, both virtual and physical. These, we actually asked every company within Oasis 500 to recruit at least eight mentors by the time they do, and they're in the second month of, of acceleration. And, and that proved very helpful. We know for a fact that um, mentorship helped increase the probability of any startup by 50%. That's why we pushed for it as much as we could. And that's why we, we encouraged all of our entrepreneurs to learn as much as they can and then pass on that knowledge to the uh, newer generation of entrepreneurs coming into the pipeline. Oh, wow, thank you. Thank you for sharing. That's impressive. So now if we ask Mr. Murat, he's been traveling to Qatar several times, yes? You've been traveling to Qatar several times? Yes, I was here last year as well. All right. So now, can you please tell us what difference you found between the first time and the, this time? And what do you think that Qatar needs to create that beautiful ecosystem, collaboration, uh, mentor, mentoring mentors and entrepreneurs and all we've been talking about? So definitely, I see more energy, more like lots more people. Uh, so. I think the energy is here. So to establish a healthy ecosystem for startups, you need multiple um, sides of people. Like you need investors, you need the capital, and you need entrepreneurs. And I guess also the country culture has to nurture both sides as well. The country has to like support the investors, encourage them to invest more, and the country also the culture has to support the entrepreneurs to start new companies take a risk and in return pro like promise like high returns and fame and fortune obviously so 
I think it takes a couple generations. For example, like Silicon Valley is in their 15th or like 20th uh, generation where uh, the entrepreneurs that were, they started companies in the 80s or 90s, they exited, they became angel investors, they started new companies, they invested in other companies. In New York, we are in our third, maybe second or third cycle where people start companies in the 90s, they sold and have their angel investors, they support new upcoming entrepreneurs. So in Qatar, I think we need success stories, role models to sell their first companies and become angel investors and like hardcore mentors for the second generation of entrepreneurs. That's why the Qatar University Incubation Center, you got 146 applications, that's very impressive that shows that young people want to start companies because that's the best time to start a company, to learn. Uh, you learn so much more while trying to do something than just read a book while you're working at a large company. So I guess you just need to um, enable capital more, which you are doing already. And also when there are potentially like large potential companies, give them extra support so you can have like two, three success stories. I know like a company I was talking to last year, now they are in San Francisco, uh, Khalid, and hopefully, yes, so hopefully he's going to be a great success story and then young people will be inspired by him. Definitely. Uh, Khalid Bujassoum, he's one of uh, Qatar's inventors and as well he created a company that they create games. Now he is in San Francisco creating his other company and pitching for new ideas. So congratulations for that. And I believe, as well uh, from what can I see in here, other entrepreneurs, Qataris and people who live in this country, they can become similar like him, Khalid Bujassoum. And if we go to Dr. Mahmoud, he can reflect on <laughs> what Mr. Murat said. What we are doing, as I mentioned, we are concerned to create entrepreneurial culture. And this requires sharing experience, sharing knowledge about the ecosystem of entrepreneurship. I just gave you an example. Yesterday we have a seminar about ecosystem in Qatar, entrepreneurship ecosystem. And we have speakers from the government, speakers from entrepreneurship, entrepreneurs themselves. We have a case, a successful case. And we have the audience, our student. So the student, the student have an idea about what is entrepreneurship, what is their skills, how they can develop their skills, and how is the government supporting them. Is their work important for the nation why is it important for Qatar to diversify their economy? So this is one important matter that to tell the student that what you are doing is even it is a personal matter is going to uh, make you self-satisfied, achieve your objective, is going also to contribute to your country, to diversify your economy. This is one side. Also when we give them the case of successful case, the entrepreneurs face some challenge. Sometimes they fail, and if they fail, it's not the end of the world. They can try again, and they will success by the end. Uh, this situation gives them like the motivation to be entrepreneurs, and the way how to develop their skills, how to where to get support if they fail, and how this is going to develop their nation. So this kind of sharing information. Okay. Also, we care of our student. Sometimes the student approach you, I'm, I have an idea. I would like to do something. So we give them the right way. Is this your idea is going to be successful or how you can move forward in developing your idea? So working closely with the student during their break times, during their holidays, this is the best way to create entrepreneurial culture in Qatar. This is our belief. Okay. Yes, that's a real belief. And I believe those entrepreneurs will find a lot of challenges. 
And who's better to talk to us about challenges than Mr. Chris? So, Mr. Chris, please tell us and give us the small story about those challenges that can any entrepreneur face, and especially in Silicon Valley, and where everyone is there and you know jumping the gun and doing all these beautiful stuff in there. So. One of the challenges, I think, and this is not just a Silicon Valley challenge, this is a global challenge, is that, you know, to quote Thomas Friedman, the world is getting truly flat, right? And that as an entrepreneur in Silicon Valley, you are actually competing with entrepreneurs in Qatar. And as an entrepreneur in Qatar, you're competing with entrepreneurs in Silicon Valley. And that more and more, in order to be successful, you're going to have to adopt sort of a global, multicultural, multi-language, international view from the very beginning of your company. And that if you don't do that, you're gonna end up limiting yourself. You're gonna end up limiting the scale of your company, you're gonna end up limiting the success of your company, and ultimately, you know, you're not going to win because someone who has that multinational global view is gonna come along and as we say in Silicon Valley, eat your lunch, right? And so I think it's a real challenge, and this is not just a Silicon Valley problem, but the, the other thing I'm always fascinated by is the actual psychology of entrepreneurship. Because, you know, I've been an entrepreneur all my life, right? I sold my first software company when I was in university. And, you know, all of us that are entrepreneurs are actually more than a little bit crazy, right? And Tell we, me about it. <laughs> <laughs> and what you have to be able to balance as an entrepreneur is you have to hold two different thoughts at the same time. One is what I like to call irrational self-confidence, okay? Not just being self-confident, it's the idea that, wow, I actually can go take on the world and win, right? Frame do I, that. Do, do I have any real basis for that belief? No, but I'm irrational, so I hold that, right? But at the same time, you have to hold the fact that it is the market, not you, that decides whether or not you're going to be successful. And that you have to position yourself in such a way that you can actually address the needs of the market. It's ultimately the consumer, it's the person who has the money that's gonna give you the money, right, that ultimately decides whether or not you're successful. Just because I believe someone wants my product and is willing to pay me for it, doesn't mean they will actually pay me for it, right? And you have to be able to hold those two ideas and find some way to bring them together in your, in your head. And this is, I keep coming back to the topic of community, but this is why community and mentors and all of these things are so important. It's because it's the experience of those that went before you that helps you figure out how do you blend those two things together. In another way, creating your own competitive advantage. Finding the spark. Well, it's the Steve Jobs expression, right? It's a reality distortion field, right? It's the bubble in which my reality is just different than everybody else's. And that the problem with reality distortion fields is unless you're Steve, right, eventually the real world shows up and impinges on that distortion, right? But you have to keep that distortion going for quite some time. You touched a very soft spot in my heart. God rest his soul in peace, <laughs> Steve Jobs. So, Mr. Khalid, you've been roaming the globe and talking about the culture and the difference and how the entrepreneur should, ha should, uh, should have that multicultural mindset. How you address that in our Arab world? Okay, um, just to give a, a jump a little bit. I've, I've joined Enterprise Qatar uh, since last March of last year. So it's been a year and, and, and three months almost right now. Um, and uh, just building up on what, what we said about Khalid Abu Jassoum, we actually at Enterprise Qatar launched a program to support creative and innovation-based products and, and projects. And Khalid Abu Jassoum is the pilot of our program. 
we actually sent him to Silicon Valley, so he's in complete support by Enterprise Qatar, which I'm, I'm, I'm proud to say today. Um, Congratulations. Thank you. The, the, the cultural element is, is very critical. We, we used to encourage, and I still do encourage, all of our entrepreneurs, whether in here or in other areas of the airport, to think global, act local. Focus on the local market, but keep your eyes always on the horizon. Understand your market, understand your customers, um, and make sure that whatever you develop here has a global appeal. Because at the end of the day, uh, as Chris said uh, rightfully, it's the global market is your, your competitor. You know, you're going to compete with people from India, from, from Southeast Asia, from Latin America, from the US, from all across. We live in a, in a truly global village, and you cannot ignore that fact. Now, one of the challenges that I found in, in the Arab world, across the Arab world, is, is, cultural, is the cultural challenge, and that's the fear of failure. We're, we're not risk averse. We try to um, uh, mitigate risk by sticking to the comfort zone. So a lot of us uh, would rather stick to a salary uh, knowing that they're going to end up with a, you know, a check at the end of the month rather than taking the plunge and taking that chance and creating their own wealth and controlling it. Um, it's something we have to deal with. Um, and, and then, but then how do we address that is by addressing the entire ecosystem. And gradually, maybe after two or three or four, or even ten generations, we can produce enough entrepreneurs who believe in themselves and they're willing to take that risk because our region, if you think historically, our region is a region of trade. So people are used to taking risks. Our history is filled with examples of people taking risks. Okay? Uh, we have, a history, you know, from, from the, the Islamic history, uh, the, the famous Sahabi who asked them, you know, when they get to the Medina after migrating from Mecca, said, show me where the market is. Don't give me cash, I don't need it. Just show me where the market is. That's the kind of culture we need to go back into. We, we are known to be innovators, uh, seafarers, people who explore. That, that kind of culture has to come back to us. We have to embrace it again and embrace fear that comes with taking risk, but not shy away from it, but embrace it and deal with it. What we're trying to do, for example, at Enterprise Qatar is in trying to strengthen and become a very strong part of the entire ecosystem. We reach out to everybody, to Cubic, to QDB, to university, Qatar University, uh, to, to Redo, to everybody who can help support the journey of the entrepreneur. We believe that every entrepreneur, once he goes from or she goes from an idea stage and start acting on that idea, they take on a journey. Our objective, our plan, our aim is to figure out who can help them go from each stage of that journey successfully completed and move on to the second stage. Wow. Thank you very much. Who would like to take that journey? Actually, uh, I've been an a serial entrepreneur since I was 17 years old. So I took the journey. Long time back. Now I give it to you my beautiful audiences, who would like to take the journey? The journey of entrepreneurship. Who's got the right question to ask? Our great panel in here. Who's daring enough to ask the question? Who's got no daredevils in here? Oh my goodness. No, no one would like to become an entrepreneur? In the oh. back. In the back. Back left. Back left. Back left. All right, I have back left and back right. So the back left is for the lady in there? I just saw the hand. Oh, you saw the hand. The la so ladies first? Thank you, gentlemen. I'll come back to you, definitely. And no one is supporting me to carry the, the mic. <laughs> Please. Thank you. Uh, but I, I hear you focusing on youth, and I think you may be missing some of the equation, which is wisdom. Uh, I started real estate company in Abu Dhabi nine years ago, and I'm sort of middle-aged at least. So I think that uh, 
older people can also be really good entrepreneurs, not just mentors, but can be entrepreneurs and start companies that have good ideas and can follow them through as well as you know, the young. So thank you. Oh, thank you. That's so brave. Middle-aged entrepreneur. What you can say about that? Panel? Oh, I just speaking from a Silicon Valley perspective, you know, we have serial entrepreneurs. It's not just the 20 year olds. You know, we see people as old as 70 going out and starting their next company. I mean, it's it's one of those things. I view it as it's a virus. Once it gets in your system, it never really leaves. It just goes dormant for a little while. And I agree with you that the experience and the wisdom is actually one of the critical success factors. Either you've accumulated it yourself or through a mentor network, you have the ability to bring that wisdom to your effort. So everybody here knows that the U.S. is like, you're all thinking in the U.S. entrepreneurs are like 22 years old, right? So. Who knows the average age for entrepreneurs in the U.S.? 55. No. The average age for entrepreneurs, first-time entrepreneurs in the U.S. No. Oh, I can't hear everything. Well, it's uh, it's 39. It is not 22. So I totally agree. I think people learn, they work somewhere, they accumulate, and they get excited about the idea, and then they go and launch their company. So, totally. Uh, if I may just add, an entrepreneurship is not really about age. It's a mindset. And you, you can be, it, the virus, as Chris said, the virus could hit you at 60, at 70, at 20, or 19. It could hit you at any time. But once you have the mindset, the critical aspect is to learn. I think you're right on when you said it's about wisdom. But wisdom does not have to come with just years. It can come from an accumulated experiences of those you surround yourself with. And this is why Silicon Valley was so advanced, and still so advanced right now, because they have that accumulated knowledge that's shared all the time, and it's reinvented and added to all the time. And we benefit, we all benefit from it. Oh, wow. Question? Excuse me. Yeah. So I have a question for all the panel. In in the ecosystem of entrepreneurship here and in the U.S., what challenges do we have that they don't in the states or in Silicon Valley? Uh, I can start with the first thing: the culture. Uh, I think I alluded to it a little early on. It's we have the fear of failure, and uh, and this is common. This is something that across the Arab world is is there. It's dominant. It stops a lot of people because. In reality, a lot of your support system okay, uh, would nag at you if you actually take that plunge. I know in Jordan, for example, it's a very pessimistic culture. Okay, So if you fail, everybody's going to point fingers at you and say, you know, told you so, don't do it, stick to your job, you know, so what happened to you? So having that support system, that, that cultural support system is critical. Uh, if you are female, for example, and I do apologize to all the ladies, but it's very true. If you are female, it's twice as much in terms of criticism, if not more. Because now you're, you're defining your role as, as the domestic engineer, and you're branching out and you're trying to, to establish something for yourself and prove yourself. And uh, let's face it, in, 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 a, in a male dominant country, um, take Jordan for example, it's not easy. It's not easy at all. And, and I totally believe that. You know, I raise my hat to all of you ladies out there who are entrepreneurs because they have really done much more than men in proving themselves. So thank you. Wow. Big clap for the ladies there. Thank you very much. Actually, there's someone before you asked me for the question. I was going to so a follow up on the original one. Then we'll get back to you. No, no, uh, it was a follow-up on the previous one, so it's right. uh, Hello, I have a question about the uh, Arabic content startups. Uh, what is the scope for Arabic content startups in Silicon Valley, for example, or our countries outside the Middle East? I, I'm sorry, I didn't get the question. Uh, the Arabic content startup, the people who develop Arabic content, Arabic uh, games, Arabic uh, animation, and things like that, or Arabic uh, applications, what is the scope that they have for in Silicon Valley if, if they want to uh, find an investor over there or move their business to Silicon Valley, for example, and then get incubated over there? What is the scope for them in, uh, in California itself? So it, it's certainly harder 
and part of the reason that it's harder is that most of the investors in Silicon Valley don't understand this part of the world. They don't understand the economics, they don't understand the demographics, and it's hard to persuade somebody to invest in something they don't fully understand. But having said that, if you can make the case for how we're going to go make a lot of money, I mean, Silicon Valley investors really care about one thing and one thing only, which is let's go make a lot of money. Now, having said that, if you look at the CEOs of tech startups in Silicon Valley, more than half of them were not born in the United States. It's now pushing almost 60% of the founders in Silicon Valley were not born in the US. And so there is absolutely you know, a willingness to sort of take this stuff on. But the part of the problem is, is that the investor community is a generation behind and the investor community is not as multicultural and international as the actual entrepreneurs in the Valley are today. So you will skip the hay to another hill. <laughs> I, I can actually comment on that as well because I am an investor myself and I have a, a lady I invested in who is currently in, in San Francisco and she's been accepted just today to the plug and play accelerator. Congratulations. Thank you. Uh, there's a huge opportunity in there. Uh, our friends, the Chinese, uh, you know, they, they use um, symbols. The symbol for disaster or catastrophe is the same symbol for opportunity. There is a huge opportunity for us. And, and here's the reason. 5% of all internet users, for example, come from the Arab world. While the Arabic content online is less than 1% of all content available. So there is a huge opportunity. And as Chris said, money chases, chases opportunity. If you have a solid business model and you have something to offer, people are going to come after you. Because you're addressing a niche market that's completely consumer-based. It's all consumption-based. Okay, So you offer something that of value, people are going to jump on you. I know that for a fact. So if you have something, go after it, prove it, and then you can you know, come and talk to me. We'll sit and find a way to do it. Wow. That's an offer. An offer can be turned. Anyone else want, would like to jump the wagon? Hi, thanks very much. Um, yeah, I think with, with all of your organizations, presumably there's a, an application process. Um, so I just wanted to ask if you have any advice on how to go about applying and making sure that your startup stands out in, in an online application and whether it's necessary to uh, network with the people that you're applying to beforehand and how you do that from here if you're applying to ERA in New York or um, the uh, US Max scheme or, or any other Y Combinator, etc. cetera, um, where you don't have access to people physically. Great question. Uh, we take around 1,500 applications, 1,500 applications every six months. And we read them one by one. We pick 100 companies to interview in person. So we, what impresses us is if a person finds us through a common contact, gets an introduction, and says, hey, I'll, I applied online, but I also wanted to like connect with you, get coffee. Or if you're not in New York, like have a Skype call or have a phone call with you. So that shows initiative, that shows you're really passionate about your idea. You're not just like, oh, let me, by the way, apply online and it's so it's free to apply online, let me just put this in. So that really sh filters you from other people and that puts you in a very good position. Obviously, if all 1,500 people do that, we'll be dead, but don't tell anybody, this is between us. It's really a good idea to find personal connections to the founders of these programs. And also, in the application, put in your other accomplishments. For example, you were like a track champion in high school, or you know, you scaled Mount Everest, I don't know, something interesting. So we are looking for people, for personalities that are passionate, that, are, that want to win, that are ambitious. So uh, in addition to all the business model and market size requirements, that's a big uh, differentiator for us. Wow. That's a tip, guys. Come on. You'd like to say something? So I'm going to echo what he just said, is that teams matter. 
you need to convince whomever would, is running the accelerator, the incubator that you want to apply to, that you and your team have the right stuff. Because a great team can take a so-so business idea, a so-so product, and they can make it better, they can pivot, they can change, they can adapt, right? A great team can take an, a moderate to bad idea and make it great, okay? A great product cannot save a bad team, right? So team is completely overlooked by a lot of people. The other thought I would leave you with is a, a entrepreneur in Silicon Valley I know always asks the following questions about an idea or a startup, which is, are there real people who have a real problem who are willing to give you real money to make that problem go away? And if the answer to those three questions is not yes, you're not there, right? The purpose of a startup is not to create a product. The purpose of a startup is to create a business model that scales. And as somebody that runs an accelerator, I want to understand your business model and your team way more than I want to understand the ins and outs of your product and the feature and look Dear at the guests, look at the beauty of your product. We'll start at six o'clock. I, I can just add a little bit to that. The speaker will be Mr. Anas Sawal of Cisco. Topic: Driving Urban Innovations. Please proceed to Auditorium Three. Uh, it's really never about the idea when, when you first at least join or try to join an accelerator or an incubator. It's about you as, as a person. The decision to invest is not about investing in an idea because an idea could be copied, could be pivoted, could be changed. Once you enter an accelerator, you end up in three months with a completely different idea. Um, that doesn't mean that the idea is bad. That means it's just you adopt to the market and you adopt to the real opportunity out there. But my decision is to invest in you as a person and you as a team. If you have what it takes, if you have that magical chemistry, then I'm in. If I don't see that, if I don't see the passion, if I don't see the commitment, if I don't see uh, per perseverance and consistency in working day in, day out, 18 hours, more than that. If you, as somebody said before, you need eight hours to survive. Anything for the, above that is to succeed. So. If you don't have what it takes, don't bother. So, to be an entrepreneur, you need to do it 24-7. Passion, perseverance, and the last word you said? Commitment. Huge, huge commitment. And now for our last question. Hello? Can you hear me? Um, so louder, please. Okay, there are different types of knowledge. There's the experienced knowledge, there's the um, theoretical knowledge, and then there's this passion where you can just come up with those sparkler ideas. And sometimes you keep jumping on between applying the knowledge in between reading and between getting new ideas. What is the right balance for an entrepreneur to gain knowledge and to apply it? My question is clear. I think uh, building knowledge is important for entrepreneurs, and this is what we are doing. Uh, at the beginning, if you have an idea, just think how to move forward. You think this is right or wrong. If you find some events, some seminars, some uh, training programs, why not, why not uh, attending it? Why not? asking question why not going to the internet to get some information about knowledge about entrepreneurship you will find many uh, online materials that which can help you at the beginning is this my idea can be developed how i can move from theoretical bar to implementation bar and sometimes you find here we, we face a challenge in uh, in developing the knowledge we have a training program with ICT Qatar, and we are coming from academia, for example, and we have theoretical knowledge which we move forward. This is the building blocks for developing your model. And we face sometimes a challenge that the audience looking for something is more practical. They are not interested in some theoretical. But you, could, you couldn't go 
for, for practical matter without at least minimum background. So both of them are important for entrepreneurs. You have at least a minimum background in theoretical aspect for entrepreneurship, in theoretical aspect for building your financial plan. And then you can develop your financial plan, your, uh, your figures for your product. This is what we are looking for. So both are important, theoretical and practical. You couldn't it depends. So if you are for marketing, sometimes for marketing matters, you are concerned about uh, more practical matters rather than theoretical. Branding your product, how to make your product well known to the public. So it depends what, which part of knowledge you are interested in. Uh, I can just add to that. It also depends on you as a person. The different people learn differently. Some people are theoretical, they, they think abstract. Some people are hands-on. Okay, and some people will just come up with ideas. But at the end of the day, it's uh, go back to the same thing. It's about execution. Okay, an idea could be as simple as possible. If you execute it right, you deliver it right to the people, you make money out of it. Okay, uh, this is what we're talking about. At the end of the day, you're gonna make money. Don't listen to anybody who's trying to fully unbluff you and say, it's not about money. Yes, it is. Okay, it is about the money. Yes, you wanna put effort, and you have a message and you have, you know, you've got something to deliver, but at the end of the day, if nobody pays you, you're not gonna do it. So it's about money. The, the trick and the challenge is to, where do I, how do I put all of my knowledge, and more importantly, where are the, the barriers of my knowledge so I can add more to it? If I cannot, for example, if I wanna find a solution to um, cold fusion, okay? Theoretically, it's been proven, it can be done. Practically, do I have the right tool set? If not, there are other people out there who can complement what I have. Together as a team, we can solve this. So the, the, the trick to it is understanding where your capabilities are limited, where are the limits of your capabilities, and then add more to it by adding more people. This is why teams win, individuals have a really hard time implementing anything. Thank you very much. I thank you very much all. Please give a clap of hands for our uh, panelists. I thank you very much Mr. Khalid, Dr. Mahmoud, Mr. Murat, and our great friend Chris for being here in our panel. I thank you all for being with us. Thank you very much. It's a beautiful closing of Kitcom. And we will have now the competition, so don't go away. It's a beautiful competition for people to Rumble!